Thank you. Why don't you take a seat? Good to see many faces today. I know it's school holidays at the moment. A lot of people sick at the moment too. Heard a few coughs during the videos. <laughs> Uh, before I begin today, uh, I wanted to just take a moment to congratulate um, Mr. and Mrs. Jack and Emily Robinson on 50 years of marriage. 50 years of marriage. How incredible. They celebrated last weekend. So what a legacy. We're, we celebrate with you and you guys. We appreciate you guys so much. Uh, so you might be wondering, we had this huge celebration for Pastor John and Lois last week. But where are they today? Have they gone already? No, they haven't gone. But for the next two weeks today and next week, they're going to be doing the campus tour uh, before they leave. So they're visiting both campuses and so they get a bit of time with them. And, but they'll be back for the ninth. Okay, they'll be back for the ninth on the commissioning, of course. And so you can see them there. And then what, what, when are they leaving? The next day. They're leaving in the car and they're, they're going on their sabbatical. So uh, last week was, and we've already said, uh, if you weren't there last week, it was a beautiful celebration for our senior pastors. I know there's a lot of new people today, so just in case you don't know what it's all about, we, we, we celebrated um, our senior pastors who have been our senior pastors for 25 years. And so we had the privilege to be able to do that. And on Sunday night, we had an extra sort of celebration. And, um, and you would, uh, if you were there, you would have seen that I was quite emotional uncharacteristically emotional <laughs> and um and that is because um I w am deeply moved by I've been immersed in it the last two months learning their story so we could retell it last week and and so I am deeply moved by their life and their leadership even though they're my parents uh, they, they really have impacted my life so much but I was also emotional because it's an ending and endings uh, are huge. I mean, my parents handing over being the senior pastors is, is significant for my life. It is, it is a huge change. You know, endings mean change. Endings mean loss. Endings mean, uh, it's like there's no turning back with endings. And, and so I'm sad. I'm feeling sad. And, and I had many of you come up and talk to me last week. And, and there is a sense of sadness as their season comes to an end. There is that, and you don't have to feel bad about it because I'm right there with you. So I've been reflecting a lot lately, thanks. I've been reflecting a lot lately on endings, endings, and how God has used them in my life in the past as I deal with this one. And so today I want to talk about that, if that's okay. I want to talk about endings and beginnings. Endings and beginnings. We're talking about a lifetime of yes still today. So not only are we experiencing a transition uh, from an ending to a beginning as a church, we all experience endings and beginnings as part of life every day. All of life is a series of seasons, starts, ends, and in-betweens seasons. And so even before we were born, uh, from going from the womb out into the world, it was a transition, you know that in birth, there is, a, there is something called the point of transition in birth. And, uh, uh, and this is where the, the baby is in the birth canal and the baby is at a point of no return. That baby aunt ain't going back in, okay? <laughs> and so there's no going back. It's only forward for that baby. But how many know that forward is not appealing? The baby's like, who, me? Through there? What? <laughs> Are you kidding? The, the mother, she, some of you are giggling, <laughs> but the mother, she's in distress. Like the contractions at this point are, are intense and they are so close together. It's like she gets no break from the pain. And so the mother's in distress. The baby's being squeezed and, 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 and you know, being pushed. And, and so they're uncomfortable. The only calm one in the room is not the husband. Who said the husband? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> No, the midwife. The midwife is the only calm one because she's seen it all before. And she knows that even though there's immense pain and stress, that there is no going back. The baby is not going back. The only way out is forward. And life as they all knew it has to end. Now, we all want a new beginning. We want to hold that baby in our arms. But we don't like the painful journey to get there. 
do we? And the thing is, in life, if we're going to have new beginnings, new seasons, and growth in our life, then it often comes at a price of loss and pain. And so we're going to want to go back. We're going to want to go back. We're going to, we're going to sometimes feel tempted as we're in this journey of life. We're going to be tempted to go back where we came. We're going to be tempted to quit. We're going to be tempted to, to get bitter and to stay comfortable rather than to move into what God has for us. I want us to turn to Acts chapter 1, verse 4 uh, to verse 11. If, you know, if we're going to keep responding to the call of God on our life with yes, we, we've been talking about it, with yes, yes, year after year, decade after decade, yes, 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 Lord, then we have to understand how God uses endings and beginnings in our journey to keep us moving to where he wants us. So in this passage here, this is uh, the ending of Jesus' ministry, and it is the transition to the disciples' ministry. And what we know is that uh, Jesus, we, before this, Jesus had died, was resurrected, and there was 40 days where Jesus, after he was resurrect, resurrected, that he appeared to his disciples. He was revealing himself to many witnesses, and, uh, and then he ascended. But this was the start of a new beginning. We know what was about to take place. We knew that, that the Holy Spirit was about to usher in a completely new era of the church, a completely new model of how to follow Jesus, that there was going to be incredible miracles, a breaking down of racial, gender, cultural barriers, that there was going to be this radical kingdom lifestyle that they would start, that there would be uh, the gospel spreading, that missions would go to the ends of the earth. We know that, but the disciples didn't know that. They didn't know that yet. So it's a wonderful new beginning around the corner So in in verse 4, Jesus says this, just before he leaves, he says in verse 4, Acts chapter 1, he says, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait, wait for the gift my Father has promised, wait for the Holy Spirit. And the disciples, because they don't know that a new beginning's coming, they just revert back to the old. And they say, but Lord, in verse 6, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? What are they saying here? They're saying that they went back to the old. They thought they knew what Jesus was here to do. They thought that they knew what the future looked like. Just like sometimes we think we know what our future is going to look like. But what happened here is that, that um, they thought that the Messiah was here to restore an earthly kingdom. That, that the Messiah, that Jesus was going to make Israel great again. But all they saw was, was terrible things. And so, like, surely Jesus can't be going. They're like, well, Jesus is, you know, so the crucifixion ended that dream. Well, Jesus is, has gone. But then here Jesus is alive again teaching. They're thinking, well, I'm going to cling to that old dream. I'm going I'm to believe, yeah, that's what Jesus is here to do. But Jesus is like, no, 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 no. That was an ending. That old dream has gone. I am not here to do that. And just like sometimes we think God is going to do this in our life and then he's saying, no, I am not doing that in your life. I have something else for you. And so he says that in verse 7. He says, the Father alone has authority to set those dates and times and they are not for you to know. They are not for you to know. But he says, this is my plan. My plan is that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And then after this, Jesus was taken up into a cloud while they were watching and they could no longer see him. As they strained to see him rising into heaven, and they must have been looking very intently because then all of a sudden two Um, what we can assume is angels, two white-robed men suddenly stood among them and said, men of Galilee, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has gone. Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return. So the disciples right here could not comprehend that life was about to change dramatically. They could not comprehend that. They're still stuck on the old But before the new could begin, before the new could begin, something had to end. They had to, a a dream was lost. 
They, Jesus had to go. It was a loss. It was an ending for them. And so we have to understand that with every new season in our lives, every new era that comes in our lives, that there are three phases to it. There is an ending, there is a transition, a confusing in between, and then there is a beginning, a new beginning. So I want to talk about that today and I'll start with endings. Transitions into the new always start with endings. Always, always start with an Ecclesiastes 7 verse 8 says, better is the end of a thing than its beginning. Interesting. Better is the end of a thing than its beginning. Jesus says in John 16 verse 7, I tell you the truth, it is better for you that I go. It is better for you that I go because if I do not go, the new, the helper will not come. There is something powerful about an ending. There is something so powerful, it makes room for a new beginning. So how do endings come into our life? Are you with me today? Are you awake out there? Are you a bit hot? Is that why? Come on, try and be with me today. Um, in, how do endings come into our life? Number one, God will tell you to end something. God will tell you to end something. In Mark chapter 1, verse 17, Jesus tells Peter to leave his nets, to leave his pro profession, to leave life as he knew it. And he says, come and follow me. Follow me and I will make you fishes of men. I have, Jesus had a whole new identity, a whole new mission for Peter. But first, he had to end something. He had to end something. You know, sometimes the Holy Spirit will test your yes. You're like, yes, God. But then he says, okay, I want you to walk away from that. I want you to walk away from that relationship. I want you to walk away from that promotion. I want you to walk away from that job. I want you to walk away from, from that thing. I don't know, whatever it is in front of you, I want you to walk away from it. And what he's doing is he's testing your yes. He's testing your ability to hear his voice and to then obey lovingly. And hopefully that distance between both those things is quite short, that we don't delay in obeying God. And maybe you sense that in your life right now. You sense that, that the Holy Spirit is saying, I, I, want you to, I, I want you to leave that and follow me. Trust me. Follow me. Other times... The ending, so that's the first one, is that God will tell us to end something, and that is part of being a follower of Jesus. It never ends. Uh, other times we experience inevitable endings, endings that are outside of our control, endings that we didn't decide upon, but it happened to us. And these are part of the seasons of life, and, and they come in, in all shapes and sizes, but some of the big ones that we experience are things like this. It could be a breakup. A breakup, a relationship ending. It could be the death of a loved one. It could be losing a job. Moving country is a big one. Leaving life as you know it and stepping into the unknown. Getting a cancer diagnosis. Divorce. Affairs. Being abused. Life as you know it has ended. Being promoted. Leaving what's comfortable. Retiring. Getting married. Moving out of home. Having your first baby and your second, your third. <laughs> Kids growing up and growing in independence. It's an ending. Choosing a new career path. Old dreams dying when you start to realise, I'll never get to be what I thought. Getting older is an ending. Our capacities and our opportunities change. Ecclesiastes 3 verse 1 to 8 says, There is a time for everything. And there is a season for every activity under the heavens. And in verse 2, it says it is a time to plant and a time to uproot. You know, this whole passage, if you look at it from 1 to 8, it's all, it is all uh, beginnings and endings. It's this and it's that. And that is life. It's, it's a beginning and it's an ending. It's an ending, it's a beginning. So this whole, this whole phase, the responsibility that we have in endings and as we look at this passage, it is to let go fully. When we're experiencing an ending, that we would let go fully. To uproot this, this passage, to tear down, to mourn, 
to refrain from embracing are some of the things it says. And that is not easy. That is not easy. So where do we start? Some ideas. I think it starts first with acknowledging and becoming aware that endings have happened and endings need to happen. And so we can ask the Holy Spirit, what is in my life right now that doesn't fit into my tomorrow? What is there right now in my life that needs to end? And what has already ended, but I'm holding on? What has already ended, but I'm not letting go? Maybe it's your kids, you're not letting go. Maybe it's a relationship, you just haven't been able to close that door. And you're holding on, you're getting bitter in it, and, and, and it's not allowing you to move on to the next thing. You see, unless we let go fully, unless we close that door, we cannot go to the next season. We get stuck there. And that's not what God wants for us. So once we've become aware that an ending has happened or needs to happen, we then have to face the fear of actually letting it go. We have to look at the fears that we have, that that internal blockage that wants to resist the pain of change. And for some of us, it's the fear uh, of the pain that it will cause other people. When I make this choice, it's going to hurt others. But sometimes it's the fear of conflict. When I do this, people are going to disagree with me. They're going to try and talk me out of it. Um, It could be the fear of loss. Because when we end things, we lose things. Life cannot be the same. And so we have to grieve the loss. We have to grieve the loss and we have to normalize grief. Some people think that grief is for the unbelievers. No, grief is a part of a mature Christian's life. Grieving endings means that we are leaving and we are letting go to move into the new that God has. So we have to normalize grieving and be okay with it. Say, I don't like it. I do not like it, but it is a normal part of a mature Christian's life, the ability to sit in grief for a time. So it can feel like a death when some of these things I mentioned before, even if it's not a death, it can feel like a death. You can feel like I'm falling apart. That's why it feels wrong. How could I be, if I I was a Christian, how would I be going? But no, this is grief. Grief can feel like you're, you're losing a part of yourself to something. And so that is, that is normal. And so because of that, we can't follow our feelings when we're in this season. Oh, but if, I, but if it would be easy, if, it would be easy if it was the right. No, no, no. It's, it's possible to be in immense pain and to still have peace that you're following God. It's possible. Because also it, it's such an intense pain that, it can, that you can go through. It's also important that we have good community around us that help us to make the decision, help us to see the decision that we need to let go of things. I heard uh, it it said a little bit like this, that consider that right now your life is like standing on ice, that underneath you is ice, and the ice that you are standing on is melting, just like it is for the polar bears. Can you put that... that, um The ice is melting. Change is inevitable. Endings are coming for you. Endings are coming for me. And and we have two choices that we can make as the ice melts underneath us. We can fight endings. We can try to bury it, pretend like it's not happening. We can act like it's a failure. If it does happen, we can try to avoid it. And then we miss out on the new that God is trying to move us into. Or we can cooperate with it. We can become aware of it. We can acknowledge it. We can learn to let go. We can embrace it as part of the way that God is growing us and moving us to a new place. So we can stand on the ice that's melting or we can move with God to what he has for us next. Either way, the ice is melting, friends. (laughs) The ice is melting and it's coming for all of us. Endings are coming. But we can choose to say, God... I'm going to choose to look for you in this ending. God, where are you in this? We can choose to see it that way. So the question that I ask, the question that I hope that you can ask today is, as I follow Jesus, as I follow you, Lord, what is it that I have to let go of? What is it that I'm holding on to that I need to release to you? 
So the next phase, so after we've acknowledged and choose, uh, chose to let go of, of, of the ending, then we, have, we go into transition. You thought that one was hard. Let's go to this one. <laughs> this is the middle phase. This is the confusing in between. The confusing in between. Ezra 3, it has a picture of what this, the conflicting and the confusing emotions that are felt during this time. In this passage, and it's probably not that known, so a lot of you wouldn't know, but, but this, in this passage, the temple is being rebuilt by a new generation. And they are rebuilding the old, a new temple on the old temple's foundations. And so a lot is going on here. It says in verse 11, And all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the older priests and the Levites and the family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of the temple being laid while many others, which they assume was the younger generation, were shouting for joy. No one, I love this, no one could distinguish between the sounds of shouts of joy from the sound of weeping, because the people made so much noise and the sound was heard far away. Transition in our churches, transition in our families, in our lives, it's this mixture of joy and tears. It's this chaotic blend of yes and no. It's, it's this feels too early and this is too late. It's this combination of excitement and, this, and also apprehension. It's this combination of, of memories and dreams for the future. It's both. It's both these things. It's, it's, it's yes and no. It's I love this, I hate this. And it's difficult to know at any point in time which one is playing out. What am I feeling? And so it, this confusing in between that we all find ourselves in at points, it is so disorientating. It is so disorientating. But the, just like in the, in the last one, the main responsibility was to let go. The main responsibility of, of this confusing in between part is to wait it out. To wait it out until the new comes. To hold our nerve. To hold steady. And to allow God to do a work in us that he wants to do. Now, for many of us, the discomfort and, and the, the, the disorientation that we feel in this season, it causes us to want to run back to where we came from. Because there's a predictability, there is a comfort in that, and a safety in that that we want. And it explains why that people go back to relationships, they go back to patterns, they go back to jobs that are toxic, that are even abusive. Because it's so disorientating being in this transition time. And so we have to learn how to travel through transition, not get stuck there. Because transition is a bit like a hallway. It is not a room you stay in. You don't put furniture in a hallway. It's a room that takes you only to another room, okay? And that is what transition needs to do. It needs to take us somewhere else. You know, the direct line from uh, Egypt to Canaan in the Bible was, was one month. It only should have taken them one month, but it took them 40 years. They lived, they got stuck, and they died in transition. And we don't want that for our lives, and so we can learn a lot about what happens, what God is doing as we wait on him, as we hold our nerve, as we hold steady, as we travel through transition. If we look at uh, the stages or the metamorphosis of a caterpillar to a butterfly, there's three stages. The first stage is the caterpillar stage. And this represents the past. The caterpillar represents the old us. The cocoon stage represents transition. The butterfly stage represents the future. It represents the new beginning that you can't see yet. Now, between all of these stages is reinvention, change, transformation. But for any big transition in life, and, and many of you will relate to this, um, the cocoon stage is the one that's the killer. It's the transition stage is what takes us out. When the cocoon, or the, you can call it a chrysalis is another a word, um, nothing is recognisable anymore. It's not a caterpillar and it's not yet a butterfly. Yeah. 
what was no longer exists. If you cut it open, what you would see, not that you would, but if you did, (laughs) what you would see is caterpillar soup. The caterpillar has liquefied. The caterpillar breaks down entirely on a cellular level. And in its liquid, there are something called imaginal disks. And these disks carry like a DNA code for what's going to come next. But it's not there yet. It's not a butterfly yet. It's just still liquid. But it has the instructions of what will be formed. And so in this cocoon, in the darkness of the cocoon, something new is emerging, but it goes into meltdown. It goes into meltdown. You know, if we want to see change in our lives and in our church, unfortunately, we have to go through these seasons of meltdown, these seasons of transition where we don't know who we are anymore. We don't know what we're becoming. And there's seasons of darkness, of loneliness, of fear. There are seasons of where we probably make some poor choices. There's seasons of, of doubt and anger and sleepless nights and, and feeling disorient, disoriented. It's, it's, it's seasons of confusion. We have to go through these. You see, in the cocoon, the caterpillar has to surrender its old identity. It has to give up its, its shape, its form, its function, its identity. And it has to yield to this process of meltdown. It has to yield to it. And it knows, and we know somehow, maybe instinctively, that in this dark place of waiting, in this dark place of waiting, that something new is emerging and being formed. But you're not able to picture it yet. You're not able to talk about it yet. It's just some, somewhere deep within you, you're like, I am changing. I don't know what I'm changing into, but, but I'm changing. And so in that transition, we have to detach. We have to detach from who we used to be, what used to matter, what, what used to be our security, what used to be our mindset, what used to be maybe even our friends. And we have to uh, cling on to who God is in this season. And so we have to let go of this old version of ourselves and And people around us may not like that. People around us may not feel comfortable with us. They might miss the old us. But don't get dragged back by the caterpillar crowd. The caterpillar crowd, the caterpillar and the butterfly have nothing in common. They're on different trajectories in life. And so don't get dragged back by the caterpillar crowd. It's this thing of, of, transition is this thing of letting go what I knew. So we let go with one hand. And with the other hand, we're reaching out for something we can't yet reach for. We can't reach it yet. And so transition is for a time having nothing in both hands. I'm not who I was. I'm not yet who I'm going to be. I am in transition. It might sound strange, but right now... I feel like those old priests in, the, in Ezra crying. I cry a lot at the moment because I'm, because I'm grieving. I'm grieving over what's changing. And yet I'm also like the young ones that are shouting for joy. I'm both. It's very confusing. And so I'm painfully letting go of the certainty um, of the past season, the, the safety and joy that I have found being under my parents' leadership my whole life. And yet I'm aware that this ending is part of their obedience to God. I'm aware that this ending is part of my own obedience to God. And yet it's painful. It's hurt. It hurts. It takes grieving. And I know that there is a, a beginning that will come in the months, in the years ahead we will see what it, what, what's being formed and what God is doing. But right now, I'm aware that I have to just surrender to the meltdown, <laughs> surrender to the disorientation and the confusion and the, and the not knowing, the letting go of who I once was, where I found my security, what's, what felt safe to me. And I have to step out into the unknown with my Lord. It's disorienting holding on to nothing certain. But God has reminded me 
in this time, as I said, I've been reflecting a lot. I've been reminded about how I've felt this way in the past and how God has brought me through. I remember after a a breakup, waiting for a life partner, if a life partner would come. I remember when I got married and I left home at 27 and I started my new role as a wife, but it just didn't feel like me yet. I remember when we were trying to conceive and we were in that confusing in between for years. I remember when I had a baby and when I had her, I was just completely unraveled. I had no idea what I was doing and I felt like I was a terrible mum and yet I couldn't give her back. (laughs) I had to keep going. I experienced it after loss, after losing a baby and not knowing when the sadness would end and, and not knowing when I would have a sense of knowing why this happened. And I realized that I've learned that each time that if we look to find God in these seasons of mystery and of confusion, that our hearts in these seasons are good soil. Our hearts are good soil, unlike any other season. And God wants to plant seeds in this season. You won't see the plants grow in this season, but God is planting seeds in this season. And, I, for the, and today, for those of you that maybe you find yourself in this season today, oh, in this, this crazy in-between season of life, I want you to hear God's heart for you today in Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43, verse 18, it says, Do not dwell on the past. Grieve it. You know, you can grieve it, but you can't go back to it. It says in verse 19, See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. It starts underneath. It's starting to spring up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness. I am making streams in the wasteland. The wasteland is not a waste. It's not a waste. In the hands of God, this season is painful, but it is absolutely transformative and necessary in order for us to go into our new beginnings. And I want to close today on new beginnings, and I'm going to invite the worship team to come up. There was an author called Parker Palmer, and he said about new beginnings, he said, in the spiritual journey, each time a door closes, the rest of the world opens up. All we need to do is to stop pounding on the door that just closed and welcome the largeness of life that now lies open to our souls. After loss and waiting, God has a new beginning for you. He has new dreams. He has new vision. He has new seasons and beginnings ahead for you. But first, we have to accept that God works through endings. First, we have to let go of what doesn't fit, to let it go fully. After Jesus' death and resurrection... And his ascension, the disciples could never have dreamed what was about to happen. A whole new way of following Jesus, empowered by the Holy Spirit. Thomas goes to India on missions. Peter leads a church of thousands. They could never have imagined what God had next. But first, they had to travel through disorientation, loss, waiting, They had to give up dreams. They had to lose Jesus, their leader. The central message of our gospel is one of death and life. Death and new beginnings. And I think Jesus sums it up for us today. His words in John 12, verse 24 to 26, he says, I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone but its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. Those who love their life in this world will lose it. Those who hold loosely, who care nothing for their life, who offer it to God, they will keep it for eternity. Jesus says in verse 26, anyone who wants to serve me must follow me because my servants must be where I am and the Father will honour anyone who serves me. 
if we want to follow Christ, if we want a lifetime, our own very own lifetime of yes for Jesus, we need to learn to hold loosely to all that we have, all that we have, our position, our status, our identity, our relationships, even our independence. All of it will go until we meet Jesus face to face. Our life is a series of endings and I hope new beginnings. Our highest calling in life, it's not to be something great, it is to follow Jesus. It is to know Him, to love Him, to go where He tells us and to accept His sovereignty over every ending that happens in our life, every season that changes, that we accept that He is in it and He will use that for, to further us, to birth something new within us. We can't go back. We can't go back to the way or where things used to be. Sometimes you can't even see forward. But we can choose to find Him. We can choose to find Him in the meltdown of transition. We can choose to look for Him as He births something new in us. And the wonderful thing about it is that Jesus is there. He is with you in the darkness. He is with you when, it's, when there's obscurity and you can't see the, see the way forward. He is there. And He is loving and He is good and He is full of grace and He is full of truth and He is light unto your path. Today as we close, and can I get you all to stand to your feet? I guess what it all boils down to today, the question, is would you choose today to follow Jesus? Would you choose to follow Him through all of life's endings, all of life's messy in-betweens, all of life's new beginnings? Would you choose to follow Him? No turning back, no turning back. The team are gonna sing this song, I have decided to follow Jesus. And would you, would you use this song as an expression of your heart, your response to God today? And if this is your heart, would you sing this song to Jesus to say, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back.